Good day, everybody. Welcome to this fourth and final session in the Global Prospects and Development Institute series on globalization. Um, it's a very special pleasure today that we are co-hosting this with the Beijing Normal University and have a considerable number of students from the university here with us. So that is great to see you. Um, this is very interactive and I, I challenge you, I encourage you to put your questions into the chat box because often I find that people are a little shy and the chat box remains quiet, even though lots of questions are going through people's minds. So do please put questions in the chat box as you listen to our guests and as you have questions arising. So to this final session, the title of the whole series, Towards a New Equilibrium in International Order and Global Governance. Um, this word equilibrium has been chosen because it's a state in a process where balance between forces is steadied and calmed. The term is frequently applied in scientific theory and in economics, but in this series, we've expanded it and applied it more broadly to include stabilizing relations in the social and political realms. How do we achieve better relations, better authentic understanding and genuine cooperation between nations and in the international world, in a world confronted by ever increasing crises, be it climate emergency, geopolitical conflict, social and economic inequalities, global pandemics, I could go on. The series began with a conversation between the Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford, Professor Ian Golden, and Sir Malcolm Evans, Professor of International Law at human, of Human Rights in the University of Bristol. In that opening session, which was an important launch pad, Ian opined that future, perhaps irreversible crises will only be averted if there can be a radically new world order, one that is imagined and constructed with the same energy and ingenuity perhaps and skill that saw the changes that took place at the end of World War II when the Bretton Woods institutions were conceived. Prompted by his challenge, this series has sought the views of a range of experts across different disciplines. And today we're drawing from the social sciences and from international affairs. We're drawing on experts to get their opinion on what it will take to change, to reimagine, to re-energize global cooperation and global order. So it is my pleasure, together with the director of the Institute, uh, Dr. Shidong Wang, to introduce to you now our two guests. Firstly, let me welcome Ms. Hannah Sadik. Hannah is formerly the Global Policy Director at the Life and Peace Institute in, in Sweden, a peace-building NGO working on conflict resolution, especially in the Horn of Africa. She spent over a decade in that role and has enormous experience to share in terms of both research methodology and practice. She is now policy and thought leadership head at the MasterCard Foundation, which has seen a change of subject, if you like, but we'll see how much it has changed the process by which she goes about her work. The NGO seeks to promote um, opportunities and education amongst young people, especially in the global south. Also, I'm delighted to welcome again, someone no stranger to the, to the Institute, um, Professor Robert Walker. Um, Robert is Emeritus Professor of Green Templeton College in Oxford and currently based in China in the Academy of Social Management at Beijing Normal University. Here he is researching the experience of poverty in China during the era of the 14th five-year plan. And for those not acquainted with that language, that is the current plan of the current government. Um, Robert is also having just finished producing a book that is analyzing um, the sustainable development goals, especially eradicating poverty. We'll hear more of that at a later date in the next year, but it's good to welcome you both. I, I'm delighted to have both of you in this conversation because I know that in different ways, you have uniquely tried 
to combine research, academic research, with engagement with policy makers and with practitioners. And it's that unique blend that I'm hoping we will be able to explore today. Hannah, can we maybe just turn to you first of all, maybe just say a little bit about how you got into the whole peace building world, but especially then to tell us a little bit of how you approach the methodology you have done and why it has a distinctive quality to it, what its impact is, not only at global level, but also at the local to global level. It's a big question, but the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Myra, and such a pleasure to be with you today. And um, I'm calling you in from, from Lamu. I think it's always good when we're on Zoom just to give some place. Uh, to where we are. I'm in Lamu, which is uh, an island off, uh, off, off the coast of Kenya in the Indian Ocean near Somalia. And it's a wonderful place to think about local and global because the local, it's a very local community here. No cars, uh, donkeys and some motorbikes actually to uh, much the chagrin of, of uh, the older generation here, um, but also a place where the global has been coming uh, across the Indian Ocean and where there's just recently been a port that has been built with the support of the government of China. So I find it a very interesting place to have this conversation. So my, my journey uh, in peace building, I think started partly with my own origin story. So my, my family um, is from Ethiopia and, and they were displaced huh, because, of, because of war, because of instability, because of inequality. So I think in many ways, um, yeah, I think that really shaped sort of how I thought of myself uh, what I thought I wanted to do with my life. And initially I thought I would go the sort of the journey of, of being an academic. So I was at Uppsala University in, in Sweden studying peace and conflict research and started sort of the journey towards a PhD. And as I was there um, reading about conflict, I felt very strongly that I needed to do something about it. I couldn't sit and, and count uh, people who were dying of conflict. And, and, and I felt the, um, the very, very strong need um, to participate in the engagement in the action part of it, but with a sense of rigor and with a sense of using research for transformation. So, so that, that probably gives you a bit of backdrop for, for why I was drawn into a particular kind of peace building, a particular kind of conflict resolution. So in 2008, I came to Ethiopia um, with Life and Peace Institute. And it was um, at the time, um, a country that was just coming out of post-election violence. And this was being felt in many places, but also on university campuses. And I, I think that's interesting for, for, this, for this group in particular, that a lot of the intergroup tensions and inter-ethnic tensions were being felt between student groups and at times were, were turning violent. So a student group came to me um, hearing that I had come and that I was also myself a young person uh, of Ethiopian descent and working on these issues and said, what can we do? And we began to look at different methodologies. And what really came out strongly for us was this methodology called sustained dialogue. Um, and it wasn't developed by, by me. Um, and I don't think necessarily was developed by the person who's, who's considered to have coined it, because I think it's a fairly intuitive social change process where it combines inquiry and trying to have a deep understanding of, of why, why do we have this state? Um, who are the actors and what are the dynamics in between. Combine that with dialogue, um, which is so powerful, which is now that we have a bit of an understanding, what are the different perspectives on these things that are considered to be evidence or facts? And to have dialogue that is deep enough that, that the individuals and the actors who are part of that conversation are willing to be changed by what they're hearing and propelled into action. Um, and that's the last part of the work that we're doing. So inquiry, dialogue, and action. And we started this with just a small group of students, different, different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds. And they met together for one year in small groups of 10 to go through this process, a very iterative process of inquiry, trying to understand each other, each other's backgrounds, history, genesis, understand why do we have this problem on campus? How does it relate to the macro structures of our country, to the region, to the world? And what does that mean for what we need to do? Um, both in terms of how we relate differently at an interpersonal level, intergroup level, but also how we become active citizens. And then they, they designed an action plan. 
and, and what started out as a fairly intuitive small process um, turned out to be a, a great success in terms of those young people being, being themselves transformed and, and having that transformative experience turned out to be great champions on their campuses and later went out um, into various areas of, of, of life and work and, and really became champions for, for more sort of intergroup uh, connection, empathy, et cetera. And for me, I took away from it um, a lot in terms of, yes, we can work on the issues and that's a very important entry point, but even more, we need to work on the relationships. Because if we transform relationships and the interactions between, um, the issues also become less intractable. And it was sort of that insight that I took with me um, as I was also beginning to do more work at, at the policy level, so more complex complex problems, but still keeping that peace building principle that, that what we're trying to do here is to construct a new way of being together, a new way of coming up with, with solutions and enacting them. So, so I'll stop there, Amira, and, um, and if you have any further questions, I am happy okay. to. We can, we, can, we can pick up the story in, in later points. I mean, Robert, maybe you could come in and tell us in what way you have entered into the policy influencing world of different governments from your academic sphere. How have you engaged with governments and other sectors to try to impact what is going on in development policy? Can I connect first with what Hannah was saying in terms of um, the transformative component of her work? Um, in terms of just thinking about my journey as an academic, it's only very recently, since perhaps 2014, that I have come deeply to appreciate the value of co-production and research, which in many ways connects with what Hannah was saying. And in the research that I have been engaged with, which has been looking at the experience of poverty globally, what it means for people who, who are experiencing it, as opposed to researching it, it is a, it's a, it's the understanding that we each have different perspectives that we can bring to bear. And the point about the relationships is slightly different from, I guess, in terms of the piece, but, but those relationships carry the, the seeds of understanding as one brings together people with direct experience alongside academics and practitioners who also work on poverty and ultimately with the, with the policy community. Um, and it is, a, it is a learning process. We speak different languages. Uh, we see the world in very different ways. To be honest, we, we rather despise other perspectives because we know that ours is the correct one. Um, and I think breaking that process down is something that I have learned a great deal from, but very, very recently in my career. Back into the policy process, and I, again, I suppose, um, being autobiographical is, is somewhat self-indulgent, but I, I, I began, I suppose, my, my, my career um, as, as a civil servant. Uh, my training is in geography. Um, and what, what, what I encountered in geography was um, a discipline that was in revolution, a discipline that was moving from an understanding of the world that you described in an ideographic way to one that wanted to explain distributions. And so I essentially became very positivist. We measured things, we used statistics. And then in government, I realized that, that statistics are powerful for telling stories. They are powerful for descending civil servants and politically that important for the leaders in democracies. Um, they defend policy in a very clear way. But what, what changes policymakers' minds, at least in my experience, is much more qualitative research, where one can bring the experience of individuals metaphorically and more recently in a physical sense into the policymaking chambers of the world and get, get policymakers to listen to the story as it is a long way from where they are as they shape policies. What do those fingertips of policies look like? How do we reach them? And, and individuals with direct experience are incredibly powerful uh, for, for shifting, shifting opinion in that, in that way. Um, 
but much of my career has been servicing the needs of policymakers. I spent a decade within the British civil service and then 20 years in research laboratories, if you like, institutions that service the needs of government at national level, sometimes local, and at international level in terms of, in terms of Europe. So I spent my life researching the powerless uh, for the benefit of the powerful. My, my understanding at the time, and, and still I think, that policymakers and politicians aspire to do the right thing. They aspire to listen, they aspire to put policies in place. But research and knowledge is just one component of the many influences that take place in a political decision. My job I have seen is based on the notion that good evidence can lead to good policy, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's a process of water dripping through limestone that ultimately reshapes thinking. Um, and therefore, <laughs> I've spent a, a, an entire life in the policy-making process. And the difference I've made is equivalent to a, a small micro uh, improvement in the static types and static mites that, in a sense, decorate the policy world. Okay, Robert, I think you're being modest, but there we go. Hannah, um, you, you've heard Robert's comments. I wonder if you could take us a little bit further down this road then in terms of how, in your experience, have you gathered evidence in a way that has impacted national governments and even at an intergovernmental level? Where have you seen your method have impact? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Myra. And uh, so interesting listening to to Robert. A lot of um, a lot of insight there. And I, and I was just thinking about um, before I go to your question, um, Myra, in terms of um, policymakers and even politicians <laughs> largely wanted to do the right thing. Um, and I and I think for a long time, those of us who have been in practitioners or who've been in civil society, we have not always had that empathy. I can put, if I can use that word, <laughs> uh, um, for, for the quote unquote powerful. Um, and there's been a lot of effort on, at least from civil society side, in terms of preparing for voice, yeah? supporting voice and agency of grassroots and the powerless. And that's incredibly important and more needs to be done there. What we found over the course of sort of 10, 15 years of our work of trying to bridge between the quote unquote um, powerless and those, those who are powerful or the governed and those who are governing is that we also need to work very closely and I commend you Robert, working very closely with the policymakers, with politicians to prepare, to prepare the heart to listen. And there's much less methodology around that. There's much more work being done around prepare, preparing voice and much less in terms of what, what needs to be done beyond, beyond capacity, beyond evidence what are those additional inputs that help policymakers go from uh, aspiration, a positive aspiration, to actually enacting uh, laws, procedures, setting the authorizing environment in such a way that it actually yields those positive benefits. So just, just a reflection on this preparing for voice versus preparing for listening. Um, so in, in, in my work with, with um, Life and Peace Institute, as we were doing a lot of sort of local work, it, it, you, know, at, you know, in communities in Ethiopia, in Somalia, um, and we were looking at particularly borderland areas, it became very clear that, you know, we needed to address this, not just at a local level, not just at a, at a national level, but we needed to do something at sort of supranational level, at a regional level. Um, and, it, and it became a very interesting sort of quest of trying to bridge between borderland communities that are often in the most peripheral marginalized you know, areas of, of these countries and connecting them, not just with the center of their countries, but with this regional body um, in the Horn of Africa, it's called the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. But we were very lucky to find within this regional body, a particular unit that was willing to experiment with methodology. Um, and it was the, the unit that was dealing with early warning and early response. And they were so frustrated with the fact that the, they had all the data on the early warning, but no response. So they thought, is there another way we can do this? Is there another way where, where we are not the ones sort of 
flagging every time something is going wrong? Can we do something more structurally um, around prevention? And, and this is where we sort of combined this quest of, of this particular body um, and our own realization of, of these methodologies of, of how do you transform, how do you transform interactions such that they can catalyze action? So we, we took some of the methodology that we had learned at the intergroup level and we brought it to, to EGAD, this, this regional body. And we decided from the beginning that not only were we gonna sort of harvest evidence from different actors to see where, where are sort of the common ground, where can we find momentum for action, but to already start that co-production, use the word co-production, Robert, and the co-creation in the problem identification and how we frame what the entry point is. Um, and initially we thought it was gonna be, you know, a fairly straightforward process. Ended up, ended up taking almost a year um, just to land on the problem itself and how to even phrase it. Um, and in the end, the entry point where, where we, that was the most salient from all the different actors' point of view, from the borderland communities and the, the women traders in particular, um, who were particularly um, being targeted as they were crossing national governments, border officials, the regional body, the entry point that everyone said, okay, we need to do something here was around informal cross-border trade um, and how to, how to um, manage, harness, enable that trade and at the same time ensure cross-border security, which was the, the, the great concern on the government side. How do we both do both and? What does that both and look like? And we collected perspectives on this from the women traders, from the governments, from academics, um, from the regional body itself. And we went on this process that we call the knowledge harvest, saying that we know the knowledge is out there. So we're not trying to do new research, we're trying to not harvest the knowledge out there. Um, and we, and, we, and we want to have co-production and conversations across. So we had intra-group processes where the women traders were coming up with, with what they thought was the best way to move forward. Um, we met with the border officials separately. We met with government separately. And this, this knowledge harvest process was, was almost two years. But what was so interesting was how fast, because we had done the co-production from the issue identification to the sort of analysis phase, how fast we were able to move to enactment. So in four years, we actually had a regional policy that was adopted by all seven member states of the Horn of Africa that in essence liberalized informal cross-border trade. When we started, we didn't think it was possible. I mean, these are the kind, this has been an intractable issue. Um, but there was something about how the process was done and the joint ownership throughout um, that accelerated sort of the adoption. Now, the big question is, of course, implementation. Um, and and that's, where, that's where sort of the journey got more complicated. And I think that's also very instructive for us that, um, that oftentimes it's easy to get to the policy win, the initial policy win, but the long journey of implementing maybe requires other kinds of skills and other kinds of capacities. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Maybe that gives us a, a cue into what Robert might comment on. In, in your experience, Robert, the, 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 the gap between policy influence and implementation, you've advised many governments. Where have you found positive implementation and where have you found major barriers? Oh, that's a difficult, that's a difficult question. It's a long way from the, the brains of a policy to its fingertips. And it's, it's rare for the fingertips to reflect accurately the brain. Um, and so the, as a researcher, understanding that process of, of if you like, translation is, is particularly interesting. Actually, in China at the moment, it's, it's fascinating because in many ways, po policy, as I understand it in China, it is made in a very general level. It's made according to principles, almost poetry. And there's a sense in which the, the policy gets interpreted over time um, in various places. China's enormous. It's, it's described as being authoritarian and hierarchical. And in a way it is, but, but the, the diversity of the culture and the country means that that description is naive to the point of being stupid. Um, but there's this broad, broad um, direction of policy um, and this process of interpretation is, is typically what followed. 
I've, I've been really lucky in my experience as a, as a researcher because perhaps 50 or 60 of the research projects that I have done in my life have actually been commissioned by government. So going to Hannah's point about ownership, ownership is, is physical. It has separate meanings and different meanings. But to the extent that the government has put money behind research, at least it's going to listen. It, it might not act upon what it's told, uh, but at least you have that, that possibility of access. Also, I found that the notion of partnership with the policy community is central in doing research. So, so to get a grant, go away and then come back with a report two, three years later, doesn't work. But if you take policymakers with you, if you take them into the field, if you get them to participate in, in focus groups, for example, or help in the interpretation of the, of the statistical research even, then that ownership becomes important and it becomes much more likely that the policy will, will, will be effective. Uh, um, and, and again, a lot of my research has been on policy evaluation, which is, is really following your story to the point of design uh, to, the, to the process of implementation and realizing that in that process, there are a lot of actors whose perspectives are fundamentally different. They have different interests. They're going to be affected differently. A taxpayer and the benefit recipient over the course of their lives are going to be the same person. But at any point of time, they think of themselves as being very different. And so the work that I have mostly done has been to, to seek to engage in pluralistic evaluation, to put those different perspectives together, even when you've got a core of a, say, a randomized controlled trial, which is highly quantitative and the like, to, to bring to bear those different perspectives is, is critically important. But in terms of impact, it seems to me that, that the greatest resource is luck. Um, so, for example, I suppose the, one of the most significant impacts I, I, I've had was, was with the um, ILO, the International Labour Organization, and Recommendation 202, which talks about social protection flaws that, that ILO aspire and I aspire to being put in place in, in all countries. Now, Early in a piece of research, or early at the result stage of a piece of research, which had looked at, at, at poverty and shame, which had identified the way that people in poverty are humiliated on a day-to-day -day basis. They're considered to be poor because they're lazy and feckless and stupid. And any, any researcher, any citizen who thinks will recognize that poverty is caused structurally. It's got nothing or very, very little to do, to do with personality or to do with laziness. And so I was reporting this, we, we ran a seminar because we brought together academics and policymakers and practitioners at national and international level here or there in Oxford. Um, and a representative from the ILO came and listened and said very little. But as he left, he said, in, in my bag, I have, a, I have a draft. I have a draft of a recommendation. Um, I'd like you to read it. And he, he left, caught his plane and flew back to Geneva. Luckily, I did read that piece of paper and it was a draft of policy recommendation 202. And it was detailed, but there was no mention of anything like dignity. There was no mention of the the, the, of, the, of the response or the positive response to the insults get thrown at people who are receiving benefits. And I, I, I phoned him up and said, it hasn't got anything to do. No, he said, that's why I gave it you. So I said, what can I do? He said, well, I'm an international civil servant. I can't do anything. But if I were you, I would do this and this and this. And to cut a long story short, uh, from, that, from that stimulus, um, involving with the International Trade Union Congress and the local one, and a series of NGOs, we actually got a recommendation, we got an um, amendment uh, to that, that um, 
um, recommendation accepted. And it now has a statement that the government um, have to take responsibilities of the rights and dignitaries of the beneficiaries of, of social assistance. Uh, and that was purely accident. And the fact that I was old enough and had worked in different places to have enough networks that I could get the Italian government involved to back it. I could get, as I say, the trade unions to back it. And actually, it was the International Employers Association that put forward the amendment that was finally accepted. But pure luck drove that change and drove that impact of policy. Yeah, interesting, Robert. Hannah, how much do you feel it's luck from your perspective? Or how much would you say your engagement with the UN and with um, international organizations linked to it um, have been part of the architecture of your methods to bring about change? I should just um, tell you, it's very clear that for many people, yeah. um, be it ILO or UN, um, these organizations today look very tired um, and feel very slow. Um, mm. You've both talked about how much time and effort it takes to bring about even small changes. Um, mm. what, what do you think is the prospect? I mean, Ian Golden at the beginning was very critical of, of, of UN structures. Um, do you think from your experience, it is possible to reimagine, revitalize and, and work well in these structures? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm also, you know, having worked and lived in, in contexts where, where, you, where you sort of feel the UN's presence, be it in, in Somalia or, in Eastern DRC, where you have um, peacekeeping missions or where you have stability transition support. Um, I think people from the ground have said for a long time that this is not working. Um, so I find it always very interesting that it's often people who are the most affected who sort of are the canaries <laughs> in the mine for decades saying, this thing is not serving us well. Um, and so, so I, I find it interesting that sort of the, the momentum on the criticism is really just sort of gathering in the last maybe five, 10 years, but already from the beginning of my career, and I haven't been around as long, but, but even sort of 20 years back, there, there was a sense that we, we need to, that there needs to be this reimagination, not reform. And so, so I like the word that you're saying around reimagination, uh, revitalization. It's not tinkering at the edges. It's, it's really listening to, to those that these mechanisms are, are supposed to serve, citizens really, um, what they would like, what they need from supranational uh, bodies, from international bodies. And I think there's a need for that bottom-up perspective. Um, and there are spaces within the UN where this is possible. Um, in 2020, the, the UN um, peace building sort of unit uh, in New York was doing a review of all their peace building efforts um, across the world and sort of going about it sort of the traditional way that they're doing their evaluations, putting together <clears throat> uh, sort of a commission, people going around, very senior people going around, listening in, flying in for a day or two, flying out, uh, commissioning researchers to do work, um, but having very scanty engagement with those they were supposed to be serving. So at the Life and Peace Institute, what we managed to convince um, the UN was to allow local peace building organizations and, and local program participants of the UN do an evaluation of the UN <laughs> to actually be the ones doing the evaluation. And we managed to do this across a number of countries. And we put together a report, um, you know, helping sort of shepherd along the process. And it was so highly appreciated by, by the UN colleagues. And they, but what was so astonishing to me was that it was that it was such a radical take. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that 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 the very people that they were saying that this this was benefiting um, were able to share their their views and, and for to be for them to be accountable um, was was seen as sort of very revolutionary. So so my sense is there is a deep need. Um, to rethink. We still need international cooperation more than ever. You mentioned all the crises, uh, Myra. Mm -hmm. Poly crisis is what we're talking about now. So there, there's no need that we, that we need more solidarity, 
Um, we need to find new ways of cooperating. And some of that may also be region to region, which I'm seeing very much now um, on the African continent that you know doesn't have, always have to go up and then down, but, but how can we have more in, it, it's sort of inter-regional uh, engagements. What does that look like? How do we get in more actors um, into sort of global governance? A lot of conversations around, around reforming um, the UN Security Council, uh, looking at G20 and the seat, et cetera, for, for Africa in particular, um, that is currently completely locked out of these global governance um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But, but from, my, from my point of view, and this maybe comes from, from being a peace builder where you sort of have to have hope <laughs> and uh, where you also are thinking a lot about sort of when things break down, but that's important. There's something creative in the breakdown. It's because the equilibrium is no longer working. Yeah, uh, There are too many people who are outside of it. Um, so there is a beautiful saying that I often think about that, that came out of a conversation between um, a very well-known uh, peace builder, John Paul Lederach, and, and an academic activist, he's, he has many hats, uh, in a conversation with America Ferreira, who's a famous uh, American actress, but also sort of an activist. And in their conversation, they were talking about how dark our current times are. And there was a beautiful conversation where one of them said, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? The darkness of the womb. And that this generation here and now is called to breathe and to push and to birth what's next, what's to come. And I thought that was so inspirational because it didn't, it didn't deny that we're in, in, in dire times. Things are difficult for many people, um, but there is, there, there is still things we can be doing. So, um, some, so something for me that I often sort of come back to when I think about cooperation and what's possible. Thanks, Hannah. This vision of, of the womb being the place of birth and reimagination is, is fabulous. Um, but you also talked about the importance um, that hope is against a quite dark background. Um, going back to what uh, Professor Olden said in, in his um, introduction, he, he said that the pandemic, one of the crises we've just faced, the pandemic has permanently scarred young people's prospects. Irreversible setbacks and lost progress have rolled back the painstaking progress of recent decades to achieve the sustainable goal of education. Can I, can I take this question to both of you, but begin with Robert. Um, Robert, you're looking at sustainable goals. And I think you also are quite an optimist in your nature, but how do you respond to, to Golden's comment? irreversible setbacks, rolling back decades of progress. Um, how do you assess the, the crisis in terms of sustainable goals on the international level? I think one needs to separate out the effect of the COVID pandemic and many of the other structural impediments um, to global governance. I'm a passionate believer in global governance. I pick up on my, um, Hannah's notion of, uh, of the, the need for hope. I think if we don't have hope, we, we condemn our species to, extinct, to extinction. And the, the meetings that were held in Egypt, um, it sounds apocryphal, but in many ways, a failure to really agree strategies going forwards is illustrative of, of, of the problems that we confront. COVID itself is certainly a disaster. Its impact on education is deeply problematic because it, it will take, it, it, it will take the, the scars of the present into the next generation as, as children have missed out on substantial amounts of learning. It's also changed the labour market such that young people are going to find it much more difficult to, to enter the, enter the labour market. And my, my particular expertise is, is less on education, but, but thinking about a, the consequences, consequences of poverty and, and the suggestions are something, and I think in the region of, was it three, 386 million people 
uh, are likely to be poor in 2030, who wouldn't otherwise have been poor without the consequences of the pandemic. So the pandemic is undoubtedly very significant, but it needs, of course, to be uh, seen alongside at the moment the, the, the problems arising from Ukraine, the, the, the consequences of inflation, the extent to which nation states are, are introducing policies that inevitably protect themselves, but take no account of other countries. The, the high interest rates are, are devastating for countries in Africa and much of, much of the developing world. But I think, I think what COVID draws our real attention to is the current inability of nation states to work, work together, which is, which is why we do need fundamental reform of global governance. To be honest, we need to introduce global governance. Um, we don't have global governance, as Hannah was saying earlier. We, we have a cabal of very rich countries, many of them tied to the, to the bootstraps of the United States, who very largely determine the strategies adopted by the Bretton Woods organizations. I, I look to the United Nations as a place for hope. It's at the moment the only place that one could consider vaguely as being a global parliament where all countries come together nominally equal. We know they're not nominally equal. The Security Council is filled by the same countries that run the Bretton Woods, and so fundamentally it's problematic. But what we saw in, in, in COVID, think about COVAX. The, last, the first time I was lucky enough to, to engage with your group in, in Regent's Park College, I was there to discuss the proposals that had been published by a group of philosophers in science, which taught in the early stages of the pandemic what a just and moral response to the rollout of vaccines would look like. And what we actually saw was the total opposite of what they were arguing for, both on medical grounds, a rollout of a convoy, all countries moving at the same rate, uh, and morally the right one, whereby everybody was protected on the basis of their global citizenship, not on the basis of whether they happened to be born in a filthy rich country. And so it fundamentally draws attention to the limitations of global governance and should wake us all up to the fact that the system is grossly unfair and those of us who've been brought up in the, in the rich West are living our lives based on historical and continuing exploitation of other countries and other global citizens. And at the moment, we have a system which is politically, in terms of international relations, based on a model of neorealism, a model which says, think of Darwin, Think of the survivor of the citizen and let the strongest win. That, according to biologists, is not how we have evolved. Our genes have supposedly selected us to be able to live in community with each other. At the moment, we have an international system that opposes that fundamentally, and it must change. Hannah, what do you say to that? I say um, amen, <laughs> I agree, I completely agree. Um, and, and I think, you know, in many ways, it's, it's sad that um, we were not able to, to have a more preventive uh, lens to some of these things, and that we, we, we had to see things sort of erupt in the way that they have in so many different domains, um, be it migration, be it climate, uh, be it conflict, be it global health, um, and to see see some of these sort of irreversible effects um, happen. But but on the other hand, I'm also I'm also in a way you know glad there is now sort of a a, a broader choir. These changes 
in, in global governance, be it sort of, a, of the governance mechanisms or in the financing. Um, there have been too few voices, I think, who have been calling this out. And now we're, we're, we're having a, a, a greater chorus uh, and a broader coalition. Um, I'm, I'm very heartened when I hear somebody like uh, Mia Motley, the prime minister of Barbados, speak so eloquently around this from the island states, but also connecting it with Africa and people of African descent across the whole world, sort of reframing sort of the, 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 um, the coalition of, of the willing. And, and that for me gives me a sense that um, we're, we're in a moment where possibly this, this chorus um, can, yield, can yield something. And I believe that, that President Biden at the last UN General Assembly also said that we need to look at we need to look at the composition of the UN Security Council. They did not speak about the veto power, which is obviously incredibly something to look at, right? Um, and, and I think for us, having been in the in the peace building sector, it, it's always been interesting watching the UN Security Council that's supposed to be responsible for international peace and security, but not able to to have peace amongst themselves. So how in the world would they have the legitimacy to broker peace in a place like Ethiopia, for example? Um, so there the, 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 there's a serious legitimacy uh, problem, um, I think, of the, of the UN Security Council. I like the point that um, Robert is making around, around, around the, the UN and, and the sort of it being a global parliament. Um, I, I think there is more to be done, obviously, as well, in terms of what can we do more with the General Assembly? What, what, what could, how can that be empowered more? Because that, that is really the part of it that, that most likens this, this vision um, that, that Robert is, is, is laying out. And I'm looking forward to, to living in, in a world with, with more global, um, global cooperation and solidarity. And I think it needs to be, yes, between nation states, and that's incredibly important, but having worked um, at the level of civil society and community, we need to do so much more to do people-to-people -people engagement. Yeah, so 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 global solidarity between between peoples, and that was something that we we found very much in our work um, in the Horn of Africa. That as much as we were working with the regional inter intergovernmental body, really what was um, enthusing and motivating and galvanizing. Um, some of the agreements that were happening at the at the between nation states was the groundswell uh, that was coming from the bottom up of the women traders who were coming together across nation states saying that we have a common cause we want you to do something different together um, and I think we have a chance maybe hopefully to 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 have that sort of bottom up uh, more encouraged people to people across across regions um, as we're working on on sort of the global governance mechanisms. What, this is a tough question and maybe not a fair one to you both, but what do you think are the lessons that we need to learn as an international community from the crisis in Ukraine? What, what has that told us about our ability or non-ability to work together? Well, that's obviously a very hot political issue, particularly as I speak here from, from Beijing. Um, I have written quite a bit about the origins of Ukraine. And like all, all of events in the world, it's incredibly complicated. I, I'm deeply impressed by Hannah's optimism and her, her, her thinking of our ability to work together from the bottom up. Because my experience is, is somewhat, my, 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 my dream is, is with Hannah. The reality when I read the 70% the the of Britons, Americans and Germany wouldn't feel the slightest bit guilty if they personally ignored the plight of poor people in other countries. Uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goals are underpinned by the notion of, of, we, the, of we the people. And the, the realization in the UN in 2015 um, was, was that governments were the place to reach consensus. And it would be from the bottom up that Hannah talks about. And so there was this concept and this engagement and encouraging us all to personally take responsibility for the, 
17 Sustainable Development Goals. We the people. But the reality is it's we the peoples, which is in fact the terminology used in the UN Charter. It's nation states that are currently operating. It's nation states that control the, the routes to power. To Ukraine, we have a situation where when the Soviet empire collapsed, Gorbachev begged Europe to enable Russia to join the European Union. My understanding is that the European Union was told very firmly by the United States that if they did that, there would be major consequences across Atlantic relationships. What subsequently happened, as you will recall, is that Russia was left out of the post-Soviet collapse. America put billions of, of dollars in a similar sort of way to the Marshall Fund after the Second World War into the countries of Eastern Europe to boost their economies and to encourage them to adopt a neoliberal style to running the economy. Russia was deliberately excluded because America and I analyzed the situation that Russia was a very large country with great resources, which if it did have the ability to become part of the European bloc, would become a major competitor again. And America was very pleased that it had succeeded in removing Russia as a direct challenge. So historically, lack of thinking about a communal world, a prioritized for individual positions of power, led to a situation where Putin could use the fact that he was surrounded by NATO countries as a way of diverting attention from the internal domestic problems that, that Russia was engaged with. So Ukraine is a major problem. There's no way that anybody can defend what's happening in Russia at the moment. China doesn't. China says, we're not going to take sides. We need to be peacemakers. There need to be some people, some parts of the world, and you can see quite a lot of countries are trying to stay out of that particular conflict. But it is a conflict made up from global concerns. And it's not, it's not a conflict that we in the West are innocent of. Anna, we're running out of time, so you're going to be the one with the last word in this. What's your take on what the lessons that need to be learned? Yeah, um, so I've been following really from, from, the, from the African continent and, and, and I'll sort of pick up where, where Robert finished in terms of interesting to see how other countries who are obviously part of the dynamics um, have decided to act this time around. I mean, it'd be very easy to say that, okay, we see sort of um, Cold War replayed, but I don't think so. I mean, watching a number of African states, um, they've taken a different, a different position. And it's interesting to see how, how sort of the main protagonists are trying to court now and influence um, Africa to take sides, right? And Africa has resisted, you know, in different ways, at least, at least sort of in its public pronouncements. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's showing that we are definitely moving in, into a, a multipolar world. It's been said, huh? it's, 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 but it, it's interesting for me seeing from Africa how, you know, Africa has, has in some ways tried to kind of have higher ground and say, we are also here to, to broker peace huh? and, and have gone between. And, and I think it's, it's changing to some extent, and I don't know where it will all end in terms of the narrative on, you know, who, is, who, who are the peacemakers, peacemakers and who are the pawns, et cetera. Uh, and I think we, we, see a dif we see a different interplay now. And when you look at the role of Turkey, when you look at the role of the Gulf, the rise of the middle powers, there's something else happening. Um, and, and, and our global governance mechanisms, I think, have not really caught up fully um, with these new players and how they're playing, even in, these, in this big, in the big, in the big game between these different centers. So 
for me, the, the, lesson, the lesson is really around, we, and, and it's been said, we're in a new geopolitical landscape. Um, there are some of the same old dynamics, but because of the, the, the changes that we're seeing in terms of the interactions um, and the, the balance of power, I think it just again calls for for the need to update our global governance mechanisms. You know, they were they've been there for 70 years in a very different state. You know, we had a quarter of the current member states of the UN member states in place then. A lot of things have happened. What do we need to do to make sure that we are able to resolve the conflicts and the insecurities of the 21st century? I think again, it, it just begs that question that we haven't we haven't found it yet. Yet, um, and that's why we need these conversations. So, thanks so much for for convening us uh, oh, and helping us to just understand more. If there's a little a little glimmer of hope in that last intervention you've both made, it's it's about the fact that um, the world is not playing out the narrative in the same way as before, and people are beginning the geopolitical shift is beginning to show. So maybe maybe that is part of where your hope comes, Hannah and Robert. That. Something is growing up from the bottom. Something is growing up from the regions um, and from the local that will ultimately change some of our global structures. I, want I would to like to think. I would like to think it can come from the top too, to create a development paradigm where its outcome benefits every person in every country more directly and fairly. I think if we are prepared to take at face value the statement that President Xi made. Uh, to the United Nations in autumn 2021. We have the basis for thinking about how collectively we can come together. I tried to promote that with a number of letters to ministers in the UK, and they said, they're nice words, but, but China's action doesn't match its words. But I'm not sure any country matches those words. But I think if we take them as a source of hope and a basis for thinking together, about what our world should look like, then there is hope, lots of it. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Hannah. But on behalf of everybody who's participated, our huge gratitude to both of you for sharing on such a broad topic and for the wisdom you've, you've given us. And I want to thank everybody who's joined the seminar for this last one in the series. I hope that you have been able to engage well with each of them. They've certainly been rich. And if you have, ideas to share with the Institute for further developments, please do contact us. Um, but today, thank you very much indeed. And let's hope that we will meet again when there is more peace in the world. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.